Welcome, everyone, and thank you for coming to tonight's discussion on gender diversity on corporate boards. I'm Amanda Packle from the Rock Center for Corporate Governance, a co-sponsor tonight, along with the Stanford Center on the Legal Profession, the Vision 2020 Project, and Stanford Women on Boards. I'd like to thank my co-hosts, particularly Lucy Rica, the Executive Director of the Center on the Legal Profession, and Sarah Terhagen, a corporate attorney at Skadden, who is a delegate uh, for California to the Vision 2020 Project, has partnered with the Rock Center to organize a think tank series on women in leadership. Uh, tonight's discussion will focus on um, a terrific new contribution to the research on gender diversity on corporate boards, Aaron Deere's new book, Challenging Boardroom Homogeneity. We're honored to have the author here with us tonight to discuss his findings based on qualitative research of the impact of quotas in Norway and quantitative studies of the SEC's disclosure approach in the US. Uh, Aaron is a visiting professor here at Stanford, a tenured professor at Osgoode Hall Law School, and has been a visiting scholar at Oxford, Harvard, and Yale, among other places, I think, maybe. <laughs> uh, and at Yale, he met Deborah Rohde and was kind enough to share some uh, draft chapters of this wonderful book with us for an article we were writing on diversity on corporate boards. I can think of no one better than Deborah Rohde to facilitate this discussion with Aaron. Deborah, the Ernest W. McFarland Professor of Law and the Faculty Director of the Center on the Legal Profession at Stanford, has written more than 20 books and hundreds and hundreds of articles, many of which focus on leadership, gender, and diversity. I look forward to a great discussion, and I hope you'll leave wanting to learn even more from Aaron's book. We have some display copies up here for your review some uh, discount flyers you can take with you. And we actually have a representative from the Stanford Bookstore outside if you're interested in ordering a copy. Um, we'll leave about 20 minutes for questions from the audience, and we ask that you come up to one of the sta standing microphones here so that the recording can pick up your question. Thank you, Deborah and Aaron, for being here, and let's get the conversation started. Um. Thank you, Amanda, um, who is in her own right an expert on this subject. So uh, if, if all else fails, we're counting on you to pitch in. Um, so I'm just going to start the conversation by asking Aaron um, a series of, of questions that we've talked about, and then we'll throw it open to questions from all of you. But I think the most obvious place to start is with the fact of underrepresentation of women. Uh, in the US, women are 19% of uh, members of boards of Fortune 500 companies, women of color 3%, and those numbers haven't been substantially changing. Uh, women, uh, they've grown um, significantly over the last uh, 15 years, and now the number of corporations with no women on boards um, has dropped dramatically. But we're still seeing um, a familiar pattern. Uh, and women are also underrepresented as chairs of important board committees. Uh, and so I guess the question is, why so slow? What seems to be keeping us from, uh, from reaching gender parity? Experts estimate that at the current rates of change, it would take 70 years before women accounted for their fair share of board seats. Um, why do you think we're, we haven't made more progress? Right. Um, so let me start by saying my sincere thanks to Deborah and to Amanda and to Lucy for organizing tonight's event and for uh, your interest in my work, which I really, really appreciate. Um, this is a core question. If the statistics are so bad, and I would say that they're even, even worse, perhaps, than Deborah's presented, because if we look at the S&P 1500 to get a more holistic sense of corporate America, it's actually less than 15%. And as Deborah mentioned, when we look at issues of intersectionality, women of color on the Fortune 500, we're talking 2.8%. And we see no significant increase over the last seven, eight years. So why? If these statistics concern us, why do they exist to begin with? And I think there are three potential answers to this. Um, First, of course, there's the argument that I'm sure we've all heard, that there's a pool problem. There's just a dearth of qualified women candidates out there. Second, there's the argument that 
look, there may be a sufficient pool of qualified candidates, um, but they're just not interested in these directorships. They're just not interested in these positions. Um, they may be opting out or just not inclined to pursue appointments. Or third, there's a sufficient pool. Um, they're actively interested in these positions, but they're just not being selected. So if these are the three possibilities, which is it? My own view after researching this book and doing all of the, 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 the research that I've done is that a significant part of the problem lies in the coupling of unconscious bias with closed social networks. So if we just think about how boards are actually populated, um, there are a number of different ways. Firms use a number of different uh, methods, but one of the most important is tapping into the existing networks um, of directors and executives. And when you have that kind of informal process at play, it's only natural that the subjective biases that, are, that affect all of us, that affect the broader popula population, will come to the forefront. And so here in particular, I'm thinking about unconscious bias. There's a wealth of social science research that tells us that we as a society expect men to be better leaders uh, than women. And then also closed networks. We all have a tendency to populate our networks with those who are socially similar. So then if you have boards and nominating committees tapping into their own networks and you have unconscious bias informing that process and you have um, social similarities in networks, then that leads to an appointment process that's not as inclusive as we might hope. And I should say, um, it's interesting to get directors' own perceptions of this question. Um, why is this the case? And there's a really interesting study um, that I talk about in the book um, done by researchers at Harvard Business School. They surveyed over 1,000 directors in over 58 countries. And one of the questions was this. And there's a really interesting, you can separate the answer, the answer along a gender dimension. For men, the explanation, they tended to explain it um, along the lines of a pool, pool problem. There just aren't enough qualified women out there. But for women, it was much more about these closed social networks that I mentioned. So why does it matter? Yeah. Is there a business case for diversity? You know, um, Amanda and I looked at a lot of the research on whether uh, a more diverse board produces a better financially performing company. And I think our sense of it, and my sense of it from reading your book, is that that uh, research is somewhat inconclusive. The best you can find uh, strong evidence for is a correlation between diversity and financial performance. But correlation doesn't prove causation. And the causation could run in either direction. It may be that well-performing companies are more likely to want a diverse board. Uh, and uh, it isn't so much that the diverse board produces the good financial performance. So why do you think it matters? So this is an interesting question, too. If we care about the statistics, why do we care about them? And much of the discourse now centers on the business case. And um, for those of you who are interested in the empirical research on this, I really recommend uh, Deborah's article with Amanda that was just published last year in the Delaware Journal of Corporate Law. It is the best review of the empirical research that's out there. Um, and I think a lot of this depends on, Amanda and I were actually just talking about this earlier today, how do we define the business case? What does that mean? If we're talking about traditional financial performance metrics, like return on assets, return on equity, Tobin's Q, et cetera, then you're right. The empirical literature is inconclusive. And in fact, there's one particular study that actually suggests that the effects um, of gender diversity are, are, are a depression of share value. So, and, but that shouldn't be surprising to us because most of the empirical research that's been done on governance structures generally and firm value are inconclusive. So for example, the value of independent directors. So I don't think that should surprise us. But if we define the business case a little bit differently, I've um, called this in the book the modified business case, not particularly creative. Um, and if we think about this along the lines of how diversity influences group decision making, um, how it curbs the pernicious effects of groupthink, 
um, how it mitigates risk, um, how it enhances the collective intelligence of a decision-making body. Then my research that I've conducted in Norway, as well as the research of others, um, suggests that there is something there of real value. And I'm, and I'm happy to talk about that more, but that kind of value is not what you're going to see reflected necessarily in quarterly earnings reports. Yeah, although some of the, the evidence that, that goes to those points, for example, um, women, that women are less likely to take unnecessary risks, and some evidence suggesting even that testosterone has something to do with it, which prompted the famous quip at Davos that if Lehman Brothers had been Lehman Sisters, we wouldn't have seen the meltdown um, uh, that we've seen. Do you buy that? Do you think that's um, part of the story? And if so, why wouldn't that be reflected in financial performance? Well, because a lot of, well, first I should say, I think it's important to, to note that this kind of research doesn't just suggest that you put one woman or two women on your boards and you'll see these sorts of magical effects. The idea, first of all, for these kinds of studies is that there needs to be a critical mass. But secondly, I think it's about the combination of individuals rather than just gender diversity itself. It's about the combination of different styles. And this is something like, for example, in Norway, a number of directors, so we're looking at the, the jurisdiction that has the highest levels of gender representation, 40%. Um, and I, inter I was so interested in this law because the quota law essentially requires uh, certain levels of gender parity depending on the size of your board. And if you don't achieve them, that's okay, but then the state will come in and forcibly dissolve the company. <laughs> <laughs> so in another way, it's kind of not okay. <laughs> and what they told me was that it was bringing together a balance of perspectives, but also that this is stuff about decision making on tough issues. So if you're talking about mitigating risk because you're putting those processes in place, whistleblowing processes for example, you might not see that reflected in the short term earnings report, but over the long term those things are of infinite value. Yeah, yeah. Um, are there other ways, do you think, that just inclusiveness on board makes a difference in terms of good governance. I mean, one of the arguments that's often made is that it prevents a kind of groupthink. And in the case of uh, the French government, which um, has just um, instituted um, quotas, one study finds that because they've gone outside of the typical social and class network, of board directors, it's a kind of twofer. They bring not just gender diversity, but a different experience and background yeah. that's informed um, by other factors as well as sex. Yeah, so this is really interesting. Um, on the quota front, so as I mentioned, I went to Norway and I interviewed these, director, these directors. Um, Norway was the first country to have a, a quota quota, so it has the most mature regime. and. Most of the directors I interviewed, um, there was a real narrative of change. They told me that initially they were absolutely against this quota. Um, they're, you know, they're corporate directors. They're Norwegian, but they're corporate directors. They're, they're not interested in the state meddling in the affairs of the market. Um, but it was only after seeing the law in action um, that they came to appreciate its benefits, and now they support the quota. So then, you know, why would they support the quota? And much relates to this. Um, the dominant narrative, um, the dominant story I heard was that there's a real effect on governance process. Um, so for example, monitoring. If you're not from the same networks as the existing, you know, we might say the same golf club, tennis club, country club, whatever, in Norway, they, they, it's the hunting and fishing club. Um, that you're much more able to critically engage corporate management because you don't come from those same networks. Similarly, you're much more willing to engage your boardroom colleagues because you're not from those same networks. And that, I think, is a key piece of the puzzle. It contributes to this sort of uh, 
substantive independence, um, which then has you know positive implications for um, Elaine groupthink. Though this is a tricky thing as well, because if some of the value of difference, if the difference that difference makes stems from outsider status, then what will happen as women become more integrated into existing male networks? And my interviewees were sort of of two minds on this. Some felt that that might be an issue, and others felt no, that there's something about women qua women that contributes to that outsider status. That is an, and that gets us into a very tricky domain of gender essentialism, et cetera. So I think this is a tricky area, and this will be, I think, where the future research on quotas and their effect on governance needs to go. Yeah. Well, one of the sort of criticisms of the French law from the left rather than from the right is that the kind of women who get picked for these positions tend to be women who aren't going to rock the boat. Um, and certainly you see that dynamic um, in this country. So trophy directors, um, sometimes they're called. Um, they accumulate board service because they're known to be team players. And those are not the ones who are going to be the drumbeats for good governance, necessarily. Yeah, so in Norway, there's a similar term. They call, um, they call overboarded directors the golden skirts. Um, so I asked directors about this. Um, but again, there was a pretty strong narrative on this. They suggested to me that maybe initially, as boards, because let's remember, boards were forced to go out and repopulate, OK? And so initially, sure. There's a tendency to gravitate towards um, the people that you know. Um, but people told me that as the quota regime matured, that that was not the case. Because it couldn't be the case. Because you can't have a certain select group overboarded to the extent you know, necessary to fill a 40% quota. What it did do, though, and I think this is very important, is redistribute power. And I say this because it forced nominating committees to go outside of the usual go-to networks. Um, and that meant going to candidates who didn't have prior CEO experience, prior C-suite experience, but they had analogous um, skills and experience that could be tra uh, transferred into the boardroom. Um, so, you know, people I interviewed who said they just absolutely could not get a board seat until the quota, a number of them were, you know, partners at accounting firms, partners at law firms, academics, people with significant experience in uh, not-for-profit, et cetera. Yeah. Well, and th that brings up one of the other major barriers to, to women's advance um, in this country, the real preference that a lot of companies have for former CEOs. And since women are like 4% of the CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, that's going to be a conversation stopper in the nomination process. Interestingly enough, though, um, at least one study that actually asked directors whether they thought CEO experience was um, particularly useful found 79% said no. CEOs tend to be folks who like to run the show and they're you know, juggling multiple commitments, so they're not necessarily better board members. So if you force an opening of the, uh, of the criteria, a broadening of the criteria, you may get um, people who are just as good but who have been traditionally excluded. Yes, and I think that's absolutely right. And I think that will be key to the diversification project here in, in the U.S. And, and I think this kind of thinking um, is, is very recent. It's post-2008. It's what were we doing with the imperial CEO model. Maybe these individuals actually aren't the best um, directors. Yeah. Well, now... 16 countries have quotas, but they seem to be a non-starter in this country. Why do you think that is, and uh, should we be rethinking our position? Or are there other strategies that you think are more politically saleable that, that might make a difference? Yeah, I think it's important to resist a sort of one-size-fits-all um, approach to this. Um, 
different levels. And, and I do think that there are many non-legal ways to address this problem, and, and a lot of that is, stems from the wonderful um, civil society work being done, et cetera. I do think law is an important part of the equation, though, because of the, um, uh, the issues of unconscious bias, et cetera, that I mentioned earlier. So not all forms of regulation will be palatable in, in each jurisdiction. The US has its own complicated history with affirmative action, um, and in much goes to the underlying sociopolitical cu culture of the country. So for example, in Norway, there's a longstanding tradition of quotas in the political uh, realm, um, uh, party quotas um, that date back to the mid 1970s. So a number of directors told me that this sort of normalized the idea of positive discrimination. And so it wasn't, I mean, it was very controversial, don't get me wrong, but it wasn't such a big leap. Um, so what about the US? So in the US, there actually is um, existing regulation on this. Since 2010, the SEC has required listed firms um, to disclose um, in their proxy statements whether they consider diversity in populating their boards, and if so, how. So um, what was really interesting about that rule, though, is despite the letters that came in in the notice and comment period, the SEC decided not to define the term diversity. We wanted to give uh, firms the maximum ability um, to, to talk about diversity, conceptualize diversity in a way that you know, suits their business operations. So as a researcher, this, this was a gold mine. Um, <laughs> firms have to talk about diversity, and they're not compelled mm -hmm. to do it in any particular way. So I was very interested to learn what does diversity mean to corporate America. So I took uh, a sample of the S&P 100, and I analyzed the proxy statements over the first four years of the rule from 2010 to 2013. And the key takeaway on that front, and what fascinated me, is that only half of the time were companies talking about diversity in sociodemographic terms <laughs> along the lines of gender, race, et cetera. So a typical disclosure might be along the lines of diversity is absolutely very important to us. We feel we have a diversely constituted board. Um, we have someone um, from accounting, um, from law, um, someone with industry experience, et cetera. So it's too early to tell whether or not that rule will have an effect. Um, and my own view based on this examination, though, is that it likely won't. Um, but I do think that all is not lost. Um, and in the book, I make the recommendation that the SEC could restructure this rule. And I give two particular suggestions. One is to actually define diversity to include sociodemographic factors. Now, to be clear, that wouldn't mean that companies couldn't talk about these other things, which, which are important, but that they would have to consider diversity along sociodemographic lines as well. And then the second, um, suggestion is to restructure this into a comply or explain uh, format. Um, so the idea would be that there's a particular normative but elective standard and we would ask companies to comply with that standard or explain why they cannot. So or, or, or why they wish um, to take another route. Um, so for example, do you have a diversity policy? If not, why not? Do you set measurable objectives um, in terms of diverse representation? If not, why not? Um, and I think while there's no guarantee with disclosure, that kind of formulation could at least push corporate America with a bit more force than the current rule. So how are we going to get that? I think that people of influence in this country, like Deborah Rohde, should reach out <laughs> to their DC colleagues mention this new book by the, some Canadian guy <laughs> and get it on their reading list. Uh, yeah, apart from that. <laughs> apart from that, apart from that, as I mentioned, there's been, you know, there's really terrific civil society work on this, um, organizations like um, Catalyst Conference Board, 30%, uh, etc. And I think as these disclosures come in, and again, the disclosure rules is pretty new, um, what we want to see is civil society organizations tracking them um, along similar lines. And then 
institutional shareholders as well. As I mentioned, during the notice and comment period, um, I, I analyzed the, the letters that were submitted to the SEC, and it was clear that um, commentators were interested in sociodemographic information. So I think it will be important for civil society and for institutional shareholders to then go back to the SEC and say, okay, we've had this rule for a few years now. We've taken the temperature of these disclosures. We're not getting the information we want. Um, and here are some ideas for possibly, possibly changing. So if that fails, what's your fallback position? <laughs> are there other strategies, for example, um, trying to break down the closed social networks um, by getting more women into the process, mentoring programs um, for women, uh, corporate scorecards that nonprofit organizations can, uh, can keep and publicize so that the consumers would have more knowledge of, about um, companies' records on diversity, shareholder resolutions. Any of those strike you as promising? Yeah, I mean, I think that those sort of elements work hand in hand with the kind of legal regulation that I've studied in the book. Um, I think shareholder proposals can, um, can be very useful in this domain, and I think slowly we're seeing an increase in the number of proposals submitted to firms. Um, I'm now, as I talk to uh, company execs, hearing more and more about implicit bias training, which has been around for a while, but now at the executive level and at the board level, and I think that that's um, very important as well. I mean, if you know, you can do the implicit association, uh, the bias test uh, online, and I have to say, I recommend it to you. Um, I've done it, and you know, was very struck by my own results. And these are um, biases that we all. Arbor, and I think that that kind of uh, training and that kind of knowledge um, is, is important and will be a crucial step in moving forward. And one final question, and, and maybe in some ways the, the toughest question, I'll, where does this issue fit on the agenda of the women's movement? Um, a lot of folks will say, yeah, sure, it'd be nice to get more women on boards, but Truthfully, in most companies, boards don't do that much anyway. Um, they hire and fire the CEO, and you know they provide some checks on the worst things. But there's no showing that, for example, more diverse boards have done better for women in terms of getting more women executives, of getting more family-friendly policies. So if we're really concerned about women's issues, um, maybe board diversity it shouldn't be at the top of our wish list. Yeah, you really did save the tough one for last. Um, okay, so I think, first of all, I, far be it for me sitting next to Deborah Rohde to suggest what should be at the top of the women's agenda. Similarly, far be it for me as a researcher who enjoys male privilege to suggest what should be at the top of the women's agenda. Um, I hear that concern, and I think that there is validity to it. Um, do I necessarily think that this issue is at the uh, same level as uh, pay equity or representation at other levels of the firm? No. But I don't think we should undersell the value of the issue either. Um, and I say this for a couple of reasons. First of all, I understand the traditional conception of the board as being sort of, um, um, you know, the, the ornament on the Christmas tree that doesn't do much except for decorates. But I, I think that that's just not the case um, anymore. We as a society increasingly expect more of boards of directors, and especially after 2008. And boards provide um, a very crucial um, guidance function to management and a monitoring function. And I think, um, it, especially post-2008, we're seeing renewed interest in revitalizing the role of the board. The second thing is this. We have, to be, we have to manage our expectations. It might be unreasonable for us to think that more diverse uh, governance structures will necessarily have a trickle-down effect, for lack of a better term, um, to other places in the, in the corporation. Uh, we have to be, you know, and a more diverse board probably won't solve climate change either. We have to really manage our expectations. But I do think we need to remind ourselves of the fact of the continuous blurring of the public-private divide, and that in many cases, the large traded companies that I'm talking about in this book are assuming 
quasi-governmental functions. And these are important sites of power. And if we view this, not just through a business case lens, but also through a social equality lens, I can't say that we've moved that much further to social equality unless sites of institutional power in our society are diversified and reflective of the broader stakeholders that they serve. Great. Um, so um, I won't ask you to solve global climate change. Um, I'll wait for somebody from the audience to okay. do that. Uh, so um, let's open it up for questions as promised. So come to the mic because we are recording this session. Good evening. Thank you so much for taking the time. I sort of have two and you can decide. What was your aha from the research? Something that you didn't expect uh, as you went through it and just really surprising that you said, wow, I never would have seen this coming as I started. So that's a great question. Um, I think there are a number of aha moments. Two that particularly stand out for me are one, the one that I've already mentioned. I did not expect to see the, these particular disclosures. Um, there's a disclosure of one particular firm. It's interesting though, because this firm actually does fairly well on gender representation on its board, but it just came out and said, we don't look for diversity, however you define it. And I think, <laughs> so I really, I mean, this created such an interesting puzzle. Yeah, brutally honest. Um, you wanna out them? <laughs> It's in here. <laughs> Buy the book, Amazon.com. <laughs> so, but I think part of it is, you know, to some degree, disclosure as a regulatory tool, not entirely, but to some degree is premised on shaming. Um, we'll put this information out there in the public light and that will cause behavior modification. But I think that will only occur if the information brought out is an accepted social norm that we all share. And if it isn't, then there's nothing to be ashamed of. There's no potential for the degradation of a firm's reputational capital. So I think in many ways, diversity clearly is on the mind of corporations, at the workplace level, um, insisting on it from law firms, et cetera. But at the governance level, I don't think that that's happened yet. And so that sort of was the resolution that I came to. The other aha moment, and there were a number of them in Norway, but one I haven't mentioned yet, is thinking about affirmative action in this country generally, thinking about these quotas globally, one of the arguments that's often marshaled against quotas is that they will marginalize and stigmatize their intended beneficiaries, that the women who come to the boardroom will be seen as not serious contenders because they're, you know, they have a scarlet Q on their forehead, they're quota women, etc. And so I asked my interviewees about that, and they were very candid, and they said that at first th that was a concern, but then as the quota matured, that was not an issue for them. And one, because they were very confident in their competence. I mean, I think for many of these women, like again, I get back to the point, these are corporate directors, they're private ordering people, but it was almost as if they realized that free market <laughs> principles that they believed in had, had failed them. And so they had to resort to this necessary evil. But I think for a, for a number of them, because this particular law, the Norwegian law, does require critical mass, you can't really marginalize 40% of your board. Maybe 15, maybe 20, et cetera, but not 40. So for me, that was very eye-opening. Yeah. Yes. Um, coming back to the notion you had that wouldn't it be great if the SEC would uh, create a comply or disclose requirement doesn't seem likely that they'd do that anytime soon. Is there a way to use the the sort of proxy system to try to get something on the ballot uh, for shareholders meetings to just just to have an up or down vote on you know that the company should comply or disclose? Sure. So a couple of things on this. Um, comply or explain as a regulatory as a disclosure model in corporate governance is usually associated with. Uh, continental Europe, uh, Australia, Canada, um, the UK especially. Um, but there are instances of it in American mm -hmm. corporate law. Um, so for example, under Sarbanes-Oxley, you don't have to separate the role of the chair and the CEO, but if you haven't, you have to explain why. So there are, and there are a couple of other instances as well. So it's not completely foreign to American corporate law. So I don't think this is a huge stretch 
necessarily. Um, but on the proxy front, I mean, shareholders now, I mean, there was a, a proposed proxy access rule that didn't go so well, it was struck down by the DC Circuit. Um, so now I think in terms of shareholder engagement, it will be um, voting, it'll be uh, voting no on the proposed slate, and it will be submitting shareholder proposals. I think that will be the advocacy that's required on that front. Hi, as someone who is and has been a public uh, company director, um, uh, one item that I think is very subtle but is, is often missed is that boards, by their very nature, you're competing with the nature of a board. A board, by its very nature, needs to be a consensus organization. Nobody wants to be the poster child of a broken board, which is HP, which couldn't even agree on which CEO to, uh, to elect, and the guy lasted seven months. So um, that, I think, is an underlying dynamic in addition to the uh, unconscious bias. One way to get around that I've become sort of convinced over a number of years is to require term limits on the non-gov chair. Because uh, that by its very nature mandates a change and sometimes a change of point of view. It's a very powerful chair position, believe it or not. Um, and so mandating that kind of a change and a five-year term limit is plenty for a non-gov chair. So that's something that um, you know, I've started you know, emphasizing to other folks and would encourage you to, to think about that as a, as a potential uh, solution for this. Um, I think expanded proxy access and all of that is not going to happen um, and I think would have unintended bad consequences. But I think term limits on non-gov might be, might be a, a possible solution. That's a fabulous suggestion. Thank you for that. I've thought about term, and li term limits to a limited degree. So, I mean, part of the problem is there's a waiting game for diverse directors. Um, boards get increased, entrenched boards get, you know, older year after year. And um, there's a Spencer Stewart study suggesting that only about 3, 4% of the S&P 500 actually impose you know, limits on director terms. So a number of people have talked about term limits more generally. And I'm, it's a difficult thing because you also want to have that lived experience on the board. I mean, that's valuable knowledge as well. But the idea of specified term limits um, for non-governance chair is, I think, very appealing. And I really appreciate that. I've become interested in this, um, in this topic uh, because I'm CEO of a small software company. And um, when I go to a Silicon Valley bank event, I'm one of one or two women that's actually at the event. So I'm, this became very apparent to me that this was an issue. Um, and the, the, reason I, the question I'd like to pose to you is about an alternative, which is not a compliance-related idea, but it was implemented by the NFL, which is called the Rooney Rule. Um, and you guys are nodding, and you're familiar with the Rooney Rule. Um, I'm, maybe you can explain it to everybody and talk about have you considered the Rooney Rule as a, as a method of changing the dynamic? So that's a great question. Thank you. Um, I had not, so being Canadian, I'm not so familiar with the intricacies of the NFL, uh, but I actually, I had lunch with Joe Gunfest um, a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking through this issue, and he said, Aaron, have you thought about the domain of professional football? I thought to myself, hmm. I'm assuming he's not referring to the Canadian Football League. <laughs> <laughs> so then he told me about the Rooney Rule, um, which uh, was started by the Rooney families and adopted by the NFL and requires, um, as uh, coaching positions come up, requires uh, uh, a percentage of diverse candidates to actually uh, be interviewed. And I haven't looked into um, what the actual empirical effects of that have been, but. Um, as I understand for Joe, they've been positive in terms of increasing minority representation. And I think that could be uh, a very valuable, and it never really occurred to me to look to, to the NFL. But They have been positive. Yeah, the statistic is they were, in 2003, they were 6% of minority uh, coaches. And then uh, just a few later years later, it was 22%. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's very dramatic. Thank you for that. Uh, I guess I'm a little tall. Uh, uh, I'm the partner in charge for Hydric and Struggles here in Silicon Valley. And we do hundreds, if not thousands, of board searches a year. Um, and our biggest challenge to us is pool, right? Because we, our clients come to us and they say we have CEO and CFO profiles that we want. 
we have a certain amount of females that have public company board experience that are either CEOs or CFOs. Most of them are maxed out. Most of them are limited to the number of board seats that they can have. So my question is in this Norway study where, where the law came into play on kind of forcing gender diversity, did you get a sense of where else they went from a kind of skill set standpoint? Like where did they expand their networks beyond kind of the CEO and CFO profile? Yeah. So on this, I mean, and that's a really interesting perspective. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I think it's a tough transition. It, much of this comes down to what, what does it mean to be qualified for something and the sort of social construction of qualification. And if we create sort of this um, path dependency on a certain form of qualification for a certain position, it becomes very difficult to shake that. And so if year after year you've been appointing individuals who have C-suite experience, who have CFO or CEO experience, then it, that becomes entrenched. And so this was part of the Norwegian quota law is you just couldn't do this anymore. It really forced you to look elsewhere. So where exactly did they look? Um, and a, a, number, a number of pockets, I guess, started to emerge. So we're talking about lawyers. Um, we're talking about uh, accountants. Uh, we're talking about academics. We're talking about uh, people who have garnered really impressive experience in the not-for-profit world. Those were some of the typical new go-to networks that emerged. One thing that also happened in France um, when the quota law went into effect is they got more foreign uh, directors, which um, some researchers thought was uh, added a useful perspective and was sort of a twofer. So I don't know whether that would um, work for your clients. One of, the things, just real quick, one of the new areas that we're seeing particularly here locally is the product role, the chief product officer role, where we have much, we have much better gender diversity in that function as a whole. And it used to be kind of the CEO and the sales guy, I mean the CFO and the sales guy that kind of battled for that CEO spot. And now we're seeing the CFOs essentially getting moved out in Silicon Valley and the chief product officers are battling the salespeople for the CEO spot. So now we're, we've been pushing our clients here, particularly in software and where it's really relevant, but we're actually starting to make some inroads there. And we're also starting to get a little bit of kind of the software engineering piece, although still massively underrepresented by, by females. We're actually starting to see some of those positions come up in our board searches as well. Very interesting. Thank you, Sarah. Can you push back at all on the notion that CFO and CEO are the key criteria given the study I mentioned, for example, earlier, that that's not what board directors actually think? You know, I found that really interesting, and that's really one of the first times I've heard that, in general, that boards don't see that. I mean, our, our specs for board searches are so specific, because it is one of the few places in our business of executive search that we can discriminate. And so we actually have a separate database for that reason, right? Like, we're almost helping the cause, right? Because we're we're actually saying, look, we'll, we'll allow you to discriminate at 45 African American and a JD, right? We can actually sit, do that in those particular cases. Um, so we have been, like you'll see us, we sponsor every woman's forum on board directors. Like this is something that's very important to us because it's such a big part of our lives. And we really do believe in the diversity piece of it. But it is so hard getting kind of the group think shift around different types of skill sets, especially when you look at like the, the dynamics between digital marketing and how that's changing the way we go to market. When you look at the influence of sales, like an enterprise software is becoming less important and it's more about their different roads to market. So we're trying because we're, we're literally out of options. And so it's one of these things where we are trying to get our boards and the younger company boards are much more nimble and much offer a much better kind of thinking around diversity, just not only in skill set, but also in gender. But the older kind of group of, you know, late career or retired board members, those are the ones we've, we've, we have the hardest time kind of moving the needle on. Yeah. Yeah. 
Hi, I'm, um, I'm an MBA student here at Stanford, and um, I know there's a couple of my colleagues in the audience as well. Um, I'm wondering just, for, you know, personally, as a male who aspires to be an executive within a company, I'm wondering if there are structural or cultural, like, devices that um, you found as, as, as best practices in companies that do foster more diversity over those that succumb to more groupthink and, and close social networks? Right. So I, last week, um, I had a uh, there was a symposium of the book at Yale Law School. And um, there were, um, it was wonderful because it was an inter interdisciplinary group. And um, we lawyers tend to think through a particular lens. Um, but we had economists there, political scientists, sociologists, including organizational so sociologists and management scholars. And I mean, your question is such an important one because it gets to sort of internal shift, cultural shift in the DNA of the firm and how do you do that? Whereas, you know, in some ways it's easy for the lawyers to just focus on external legal regulation. And there's a wonderful organizational sociologist and I recommend his work to you. His name is Frank Dobbin um, at, at Harvard University. And he's run a number of experiments on cor internal corporate diversity programs um, and their effects on changing representation levels and the DNA of the firm. Um, and he's done that at the management level, but he was, he was very clear in his pres presentation last week that he, he thinks these results could be applied at uh, other levels of the governance structure as well. And um, he found that there are some um, types of programs that are better than others. So for example, affinity networks, which are very popular, tend to be not particularly productive in terms of increasing representation. Whereas mentoring programs and assigning responsibility for diversification um, high up the corporate chain, um, high up in the governance hierarchy, actually is very effective. Um, and this is really, this is, I think, the next frontier of this kind of organizational behavior uh, research. And um, since you brought up um, your gender, I will just share with you my own sense, um, well captured in a great New Yorker cartoon, which pictures uh, um, a board setting and the chair looking out at an audience of all men and one woman and saying, that's a great point, Miss Teague. Now let's just wait till one of the men makes it. <laughs> and I like the cartoon because it works on two levels. At one, it captures the marginalization that um, women's voices often have in these settings. But also, it points out that when a man makes a point, especially around um, an issue of gender, or when a white person makes a point around the underrepresentation of directors of color, it's heard differently because it's not, you know, there's no obvious self interest there. So just raising the issue, um, I think, um, from, from your vantage point, can make a huge difference on a number of issues in the corporate culture. And I'm always glad when we have programs like this and I see men in the room and we shouldn't underestimate how important it is to make sure that this is seen not just as a woman's issue, but a governance issue and a social issue. Hi, I've been going to uh, diversity conferences for big law, big law firms. Uh, for several years, and the issue of uh, the number of women uh, partners uh, has been at the forefront and doesn't seem to have changed much. How does that compare with boardroom diversity? Do you see one of those two growing dramatically, and if so, why? And how can we? Well, um, yeah, as it happens, I just did a study um, last summer about um, diversity that uh, involved interviewing general counsel of Fortune 500 company, Fortune 100 companies, and the managing partners of the AmLaw 100 law firms. Um, it was a skewed sample because the people who were willing to talk to me were people who were, by definition, sort of committed to diversity. But still, I was struck um, by the genuineness of their concern and the sophistication of their reasoning um, process. And my sense is that some of the same problems that 
Aaron described as barriers in the um, corporate board context are also problems in the um, in the law firm context with the added fact that there's the work family issue which a lot of them thought was the one that they hadn't managed to crack and law is um, a client service business and for large firms and large corporations there's a real mindset that it's a 24 7 proposition and that people who aren't totally fully committed just aren't going to be able to um, be as effective and most of them you know while they were genuinely committed to diversity issues not so much on the work family um, restructuring um, and so I think that that's an additional barrier that you don't find in the in the corporate governance context. Do you have thoughts on that one? Yes. If we can bring the, the NFL into this discussion. <laughs> Again? Uh, I'm wondering if we can bring the US military into this discussion. After all, the US military is perhaps the most egalitarian employer in the United States. And it is true that we don't have a female member of the Joint Chiefs. But we do have 36 four-star generals, female generals slash admirals. And if that's, if that's the case, then it's probably just a matter of time before we have a female at the top. Yeah, well, I think the military is really a wonderful illustration. They've done a lot better on racial diversity um, as well, um, better than most private institutions. Yeah. Well, and I, I think actually some of the credit um, goes to the fact that they recognized earlier on um, that excluding half of the talent pool was just, you know, not a winning solution for them. Um, and so um, it would be great if, if others got on the same bandwagon on that point. Um, I think the chairs of... Um, of law firms and uh, the, the uh, general counsel of large companies do kind of get that point about um, excluding the talent pool. They just haven't figured out a way to reconcile that with their business model, which um, remains a problem. And, you know, um, it's easy to run programs on unconscious bias, which many of them do. It's harder to actually implement strategies to combat it. We shouldn't end on that sobering note, though. Somebody has a last question here. I have one more. Um, if you were a woman considering going on a board and you were being interviewed for a board position, based on your research, are there certain questions that you would recommend asking? other than sort of the normal, you know, cultural fit and how they work and all of those sorts of things, but is there anything that stands out that might uh, give you some indication that one board might be better than another? Well, I think at the end of the day, finding the right fit is, is key. Um, but I asked uh, my Norwegian participants uh, about this, their own particular advice that they have for those who aspire to board positions. And you know, but it's it's tricky because these are individuals, a number of them are individuals who are in these positions because of the force of law. And so they weren't even getting to the point where they could contemplate asking these kinds of questions. Um, so for me, that will be, again, the next tier of research going forward um, after solving the deeper structural issues that actually get diverse candidates to the position where they're thinking about this. I guess I would fight the question a little bit and say that somebody's got to be the first penguin off the iceberg. Um, <laughs> so even on boards that aren't particularly welcoming, that's where we really need women. And same goes for issues of race. So, so I'm hoping that the candidates don't just um, think is this a you know a totally comfortable fit um, 
we we need people to, in Sheryl Sandberg's classic phrase, lean in. Um, and maybe that's the note on which to thank Aaron for a terrific day.